Psalm 119 and verse 30 says, the entrance of your words gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Uh, so it's the entrance of your words, Father, that gives light. It's the entrance to your words, Father God, that literally enlightens us. It gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And so as we seek your face, as we hear your word, Father God, I thank you for, for deepening that word within us, Lord, that we walk out strong. We're stronger than ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in Isaiah 61, we see here a prophecy. We see a prophecy that Isaiah was speaking forth and he was prophesying of Jesus to come. And it's a beautiful prophecy of literally just speaking forth that the Messiah would be coming and many of the attributes of what he will do and, and who he is. And so I want to start reading in Isaiah 61 and in verse 1. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, remember, this is Isaiah speaking this, but he's speaking it prophetically. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to those who are bound. Does that sound familiar? Does that portion of scripture sound familiar to you? Yeah. So when you go to Luke, and in keep your finger on Isaiah 61. Keep your finger there. But turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. And in verse 16, I'm going to start with 16. Because here, Jesus himself spoke this same yeah. passage, most of this passage. And it says in verse 16, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. So we have Jesus going up into his, in the Sabbath, standing up, and he's reading. And he was handed a book. They handed it to him. They handed him the book of which was going to describe him on the page that he was going to describe himself. It says, and he was handed the book, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. 18, verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus right here is confirming these words. And he goes on. He says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Those are a lot of phrases that he's saying, big phrases. Right? To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. I mean, just one of those things alone would have been like, wow. But no, there's a whole list. And it says, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Right? Amen? And then you jump down in verse 20, 21. He begins to say, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus himself could have said, I am not he. But I'm just reading from the Old Testament scriptures. But he didn't say that. He says, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. He says, you just heard it. So he didn't deny that he was the Messiah. He actually is saying, I am. He's saying, I am. And this is a prophetic act that Isaiah, let's go back to Isaiah 61, speaking these words and referencing Jesus. And then Jesus being handed this book, opening up to Isaiah. And he says, by the way, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. I am here. This is who we are speaking of. So today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, let's reread it because if this scripture is fulfilled in Jesus and it has been, it's fulfilled. Jesus came to bring this about. He is God almighty all by himself. He is God and he is and he's the Messiah. He is the Messiah, the one that has come to take the penalty away from us. And he's done that when he went to the cross. His blood set us free, right? And so when we read this, we know it was prophesied about him. We know he himself spoke it. But I want you to go one step further. And I want you to think now, you who are Christ-like, you who are Christians, right? Okay? They first called them Christians, right? In, in the in the New yeah, and the New Testament talks about they first called them Christians in Antioch. They didn't call themselves Christians. They, oh, they are. Oh, they are Christians, right? And so that is Christ-like. That's like a follower of Christ. We are followers of Christ, right? And so therefore, if we're followers of Christ, the Bible tells us that we are to imitate 
God. We're to imitate Christ, right? And so, and Paul said, imitate me as I, and follow me as I follow Christ. But he also says we are to be imitators. In other words, what you see in the word, you are to do. We are to follow. He's our example, right? So therefore, there, this is not excluded. Isaiah 61 is not excluded in what you are also to follow. I'm going to read it again. And yes, it pertains to Jesus, but it pertains to you as well. So let's reread Isaiah 61, and we're going to start back at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Well, you know, guys, we could stop there because it's so powerful. If the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, and he is, then nothing is going to be impossible for you. And then everything that he has called you to do, you will be able to do because you don't go in your own strength. You go in the strength of the Lord because the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. There's too many Christians that go in their own strength. They go in their own strength. They think they've got this. Well, the minute you think you've got this, the minute you think that you can all on your own, you have missed the most important step. And although you may be able to fool some of the people some of the times, you will never be able to fool God. And you will never be able to live fully to the complete calling of God in your life because you're going on your own strength. Here, this word, it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. We have to acknowledge this, and we, mu we must acknowledge, and we must yield to it. Like literally walk in this mindset, this understanding that, Lord, let your spirit always be upon me. I always want to be dependent upon your Holy Spirit. Never once, not one day. And no matter how big the task may seem to you, or no matter how small that task might seem to you, let me always be one that is dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Let your spirit be upon me. Do you know that no matter what assignment you have, if the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, you can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You will do what he has called you to when the Spirit Spirit of the Lord is upon you, Amen. right? So that is just verse 1. But if we were to live verse 1 of Isaiah 61, we would literally be set in, in, in the understanding of walking in sync with the Holy Spirit. We would. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because of the Lord has anointed me. So not only is he upon you, well, why is he upon you? Because you're anointed. Say, I'm anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I'm anointed. Why are you anointed? Because the anointed one lives on the inside of you. Why are you anointed? Because Christ, the anointed one, lives within you. The revelation of that transforms you from an, a mediocre Christian to a I can do all everything that he's called me to do. I will do it. Not only can I. But I will because I'm anointed. Because the anointed one lives on the inside of me. There is no sickness. There is no pain. There's no demon. There's nothing that can literally override the power God has entrusted in your life. Amen. Nothing. No assignment. No worry. You can't hear any bad. The news can't be so bad that it's greater than Christ in you. The news can't be so bad. It may feel bad, and it may be bad, but it cannot be so bad in comparison to the anointing of Christ in you. Oh, do we know what we carry? Do we know who we are? When we know what we carry and we know who we are, we literally, we transform. We can transform that which God has assigned us to transform. Situations. He's put you in situations. You, you, you know, we all have different callings, but... We're filled with his spirit. Let me back up. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. It means just to preach the gospel. And the gospel doesn't need to be preached with, you know, you just quoting scripture and the Bible open and you're standing behind a pulpit. The gospel is preached in your life as you walk in the love of God. You are preaching the word as you preach the love of God, as you preach the truth of God. And so he says, what did he say here? It says, because he says, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to the poor, the poor in spirit, to the poor, not necessarily just to the poor. You say poor and people immediately think the homeless. The people immediately think, oh, just the people that are homeless, they're on the street, they're poor. You know, there are so many people that have mansions and they're so much more poor than somebody that doesn't have a home, Amen. right? So poor, okay, we like literally void of Christ. That, that's, that's the kind of poor, void of Christ. And so where we're called to preach the good news to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent you to heal the brokenhearted. 
And sometimes that brokenhearted person is yourself. You know, and you know that with the word of God, you can apply that word and say, no, that devil doesn't get to have access to my hearts and to my heart, the brokenness in my heart anymore. He doesn't get to have access anymore. Uh uh. It's too that that was that was yesterday, the yesterdays of my life. Today we're we're waking up and we're rising up and we realize the word that is spoken is the word for me to receive into my spirit that I walk in it so that I can deliver this to others but to myself. If I deliver this word to others but I neglect delivering it to myself, then it's kind of half the picture, isn't it? And I really can't give to somebody else what I haven't first received from the Lord, right? So minister to your, let the Lord minister to you through this word. You're here to bind up the wounds, even your own. And we do so by the Spirit of God because we're anointed by the Lord. And we do so because we're to preach the good news. It is the Bible. He heals our broken hearts. And God wants to use every single one of you for greater glory, greater purpose is greater glory. He does. So to proclaim liberty to the captives, hallelujah, we get to proclaim liberty. We get to decree, oh no, I see what happened. You know, I, I, you know let me explain this for a moment here. Um, we get to proclaim liberty to the captives. So to be able to see an individual as, some, so to be able to see their past, to be able to see the captivity, and to be able to speak truth into their lives and say no, I'm here to set the captive free because of Christ in me. I, I'm here to bring forth truth because you're going to be set free right now. The past has no hold on you anymore. If we, as the body of Christ, could just be the hands and feet of Jesus for one another, we would have a much more healed church. We would have a church that really walks being like our brother's keeper, like watching out for one another. Like watching out for and seeing, oh, I see that brokenness. Oh, no, that's your past. We're, we're going to speak life over the places that seem dead. We're going to speak truth over the places that you have received a lie. We're going to speak truth. That's what we're called to do to, for one another, aren't we? Right? So that's why I love this portion. I mean, this chapter is chock full of so many amazing, beautiful, powerful truths that we are to apply in our lives. Amen? So let, let's keep going here. So to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. Oh, do you guys remember when you were bound in the world? Yes. We were bound in the world. But the word of the Lord says, the opening of the prison to those who were bound. When you were bound, you didn't know you were bound. When you were bound, you didn't necessarily know you were in a prison. Because sin has pleasure for a season. But in the end, it leads to death. So depending on how long you were in your sin, uh, at first it seemed pleasurable. Sin has pleasure for a season. But in the end, right, there's death. When you get closer to, wow, I think I'm done with this. I don't want this anymore. It, you start to see the death. And, that's, and the Lord pulled you out, rescued you, but you were a prisoner in a prison cell, and the Lord rescued you. He used someone in your life, didn't he? This is how God typically works. He will send somebody. He will speak through somebody. Somebody will be praying on your behalf. And so this is now what we are to do on behalf of somebody else, to pray for them, to speak, right, to, to speak truth, to literally make those prison walls come down. You have an assignment. Make those prison walls come down. If you see them, if you see them, and that's the key is seeing. You have to see it. When you see them, Therefore, it's your assignment. So you're like, oh, I don't think it's my assignment. I don't know what it's my assignment. I don't know this person. Stop. Because if God gives you insight, if he, and you look at an individual and you see the chains, you see, and I'm talking spiritually, you see the bondage, you see the prison, right? You see the fear, the shame, you see the, you know, the rejection, you see the lies, the unloving spirits, you, sp you see that they constantly like, sabotage themselves. Well, these are all not of God, right? You see these, you see the prison, you see the chains. If you have eyes to see, and I know you do, then you also need to have the spirit of God to say, not on my watch. I see that. I'm canceling that. Amen. There's too many people that go, it's not my business. It's none of my business. Well, maybe it is your business and you just abdicated your role. Maybe you walked away from a responsibility because you didn't realize 
This passage is not just pertaining to Jesus. It pertains to Christ in me, the hope of glory. It pertains to Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are called to preach the gospel. We are called to literally set captives free. We are called to remind ourselves the spirit of the Lord is upon us and we are anointed of God. We are called to remind ourselves to do this because the enemy always wants to lie to you and catch you off guard and cause you to feel hopeless and lifeless and oh, like, oh, you have absolutely no anointing. Uh-uh. It's wrong. It's a lie. It's not a feeling. It's just the truth. I mean, the verse 2 starts with to proclaim. The acceptable year of the Lord. That's only half of verse 2. But to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, why is it that so many don't proclaim anything? And if they do proclaim, they're not proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. They're proclaiming everything that is wrong, everything that is dead, everything that is destruction. They're, it's like, you know, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, the sky is not falling. I'm here to tell you the sky is not falling and Jesus is still on the throne. He's still on the throne, and, he, and we already know that he promises us good things. And we already know that he is returning, and he's returning for a spotless bride. And we already know that there's good things in store for those who seek him with their whole hearts. Right? Amen? So to proclaim. We are here to proclaim, to foretell. We're going to speak forth. If you're going to proclaim, you've got to open your mouth. You've got to say something. So I've got to say something. I got to say something. I'm going to proclaim. This is our job. We are called to proclaim. We're going to speak forth, speak forth truth, the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the year of the Lord. Every year is the year of the Lord. That's right, because every day is the day of the Lord. Every day is the day of the Lord. So what are you going to do with today? Because it's the day of the Lord. And what are we going to do with tomorrow? Because it's the day of the Lord. We're going to proclaim his goodness. We're going to proclaim it. We're going to speak his goodness. And, you know, just recently somebody told me, oh, I went to, uh, they were at this, I forget where they were, somewhere out. And they said to someone, um, you know, Jesus loves you, God loves you, and God sees you, and all these different things. And, you know, it was not accepted. You know, it was, uh, okay, well, that's your view. You can have your view. But that's not everybody's view. And you know what? I was so proud of this individual because, yeah, there's a lost view. But I was so proud of this individual because this individual did not let her spirit get like doused. It didn't, she didn't like get down or discouraged or, oh man, that didn't work. You know, no, instead she just kept on, well, he, he loves you. She's like, oh, that's your view. She's like, no, but you know, God loves you. So she didn't let the enemy sabotage and shut her up. Instead, she's proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what this means. We're going to proclaim God is good. He is faithful. Let me tell you about when he rescued me. Let me tell you about his goodness. Let me tell you about how he forgave me. Let me tell you how he saved my son, my daughter. Let me tell you the goodness of God. You know, they can't, te they can't refute your testimony as much as they try and may try. But they can't because it's your testimony. But our testimony is that we were dead and now we're alive. We were blind and now we see because of Christ in us. And he's not only, he didn't just cause you to live. He anointed you. Amen. He put his spirit upon you. Amen. He's instructed you to now go forth and preach that good news. To proclaim, Amen. to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. And then it goes on, it says, and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn, and to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. I know that if I was to ask for a raise of hands, beauty for ashes, that would be probably every single one of us, a testimony that we can share, probably many of them, of beauty, or our ashes, I see, ashes that were turned to beauty. He takes our ashes, and he literally causes them to be beautiful. He literally turns this around. Has he done that for you? Do you have that testimony that you say, my goodness, yes, my God, he has given me beauty for the ashes. We're not going to focus on the ashes. God's already given you beauty, but some still focus on the ashes. But the beauty has already been given. And if you focus on the ashes... Although God has already given you beauty, you're going to represent that which you think, right? Instead of the gift of God that you all are, you present a faulty, uh, you present a faulty form of what Christ has done. You just show the ashes instead of the beauty. And so we, we don't want to do that. Of course not, because we misrepresent the creator. We are not going to misrepresent the creator when he has done so much for us. I'm not saying there are no ashes, but those ashes are to remind you that God has transformed you. 
I'm not saying there are no scars, but those scars are to remind you that you have a testimony. You have a testimony that leads right back to Jesus Christ, the one that rescued you, the one that transformed. If we were to only know how many things he spared us from that we didn't have to go through, and we may never know, but he spared us of so many things, and we can give him glory because we trust him. We don't have to know everything, but we do know that he is good. So to give him beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And that spirit of heaviness, when you do a word study on the spirit of heaviness, I did this a long, long time ago, it's the spirit of depression. Depression is a spirit. And so people that struggle with depression, you guys know I used to struggle with depression severely. Spirit of depression, that's that spirit of heaviness. So low that you, can e you can't even get lower. Like you just, like you feel like you're lower than the carpet. So low, so heavy. You can't even breathe. You can't even like breathing is, is all your focus is on your next breath if you can. I don't know if some of you know what I'm talking about, but it's a spirit. It's a spirit, and it's a spirit of depression, a spirit of heaviness. It's to keep you depressed. It's to keep you bound. It's to keep you silenced. It's to keep you discouraged. It's to keep you from being productive, right? And so, but, but God says, but I have not given that to you, that spirit of, that garment of heaviness, that spirit of heaviness, which is a spirit of depression. But he's given you a garment of praise. He has literally cloaked you with something else that's far above the depression, the low, low state of mind that you couldn't even think, it affects your thinking. You couldn't speak, it affects your speaking, right? But God has taken that from you. He's removed that from you, and he's given you a garment, not just any garment, but a garment of praise. That garment, like Joseph, had that coat of many colors, right? And everyone knew, wow, there goes the favored son. But you're the favored son and you're the favored daughter. And you've been given, literally cloaked with the joy of the Lord. Say, so I have been cloaked with the joy of the Lord. I no longer carry the weight of oppression, of depression, the, gar the heaviness. I no longer carry that because I have been anointed. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you. The anointing of God is upon you to preach to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord, right? And then the garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, wow. But let's go back, this is the oil of joy for mourning, the oil of joy. You know, there's all kinds of different oils out there, isn't there? You can buy all kinds of oil. You can get olive oil. You can get, you know, canola oil. You can get avocado oil. Then, of course, you can go into the, the anointing oils, and you can get all these kind of anointing oil, all kinds of oil. But I'll tell you what. The, the, the oil that God gives us through the Holy Spirit, which is the symbolic of the Holy Spirit, right? The oil of joy, and I'm not saying your bottle says this is the oil of joy versus, well, this anointing bottle says this is the, the oil of fire, and but this one over here, and I'm not making fun of those things. I mean, we have some of those here too. We don't put our hope in them, but, you know, we, we like the way they smell, and we believe it's biblical to put oil on, and we just don't make it a ritual, but I'm talking about the oil of the Lord, I'm talking about the oil of joy that he produces within us as we just stay focused on the spirit of the living God and say, Lord, let that oil be produced in and through me more. Lord, I need more. Oh, I thank you for the oil of joy. As that oil is produced, it, comes to, it starts to flow out of you. You become a representative of God's purity, his presence, all wrapped up in, in him, isn't it? Yeah, saturation. I heard saturation over there. We become so saturated in him. And when we become saturated in the oil of the Lord that he poured into us in the first place, then we start, to, we start to give off that fragrance, the fragrance of God. And it's accepted for so many. Love it. They believe it. They love it. It's wonderful. And then for many, it's not. It's misunderstood because you can't throw your pearls to the swine. Many don't understand. And so... It would be wise of you to know when to speak certain things and when not to because sometimes we literally speak and we are speaking to the wrong crowd. So we, that's discernment and that's for another message. But the, the oil of the Lord is the oil of joy. 
He removed the sackcloth and the ashes. He removed the garment of, of heaviness, the depression. He removed that, and instead, he says, I'm pouring in. I'm, not only am I cloaking you with, with, with praise, but I'm also pouring in. So you're, I want you to see the picture, because you are cloaked. You're robed, clothed with praise. And now you're also filled with an oil that produces joy. And we know it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So that joy is not just so you can be laughing all the time, but literally so that you can have strength all the time. Amen. We have strength all the time if we just let the lover of our souls pour that his oil within us. Amen. Even when you don't feel like you have strength. You, you, you become surprised at how you actually did. You had it. You had it because you have hymns. And right after that, it says that they may, we're still in verse 3, that they may be called trees of righteousness. You know that in the NIV, the trees of righteousness is referenced to oak trees. It's referenced to an oak tree. That's a beautiful, huge, strong tree that provides so much shade. And I just think of an oak tree because you plant an oak tree, that tree is going to stay. As you let it grow, that's, a, that's fixed. It's permanently there. But he calls us like oak trees, the planting of the Lord. You've been planted. A tree planted in the soil of the Lord that does not easily shift. And in Psalm 16, how it talks about the, you know, the Lord and we don't, we're not easily moved. We are not easily, sh we don't shift, we don't move because God has planted us like an oak tree. Psalm 16. I'm going to start in verse 5, okay? It says, O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lives have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Here it is. Here it is. Are you ready for it? Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Psalm 16, verse 8. Because he's at our right side, we shall not be moved. So back in Isaiah 61, it says that we are called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. God has planted you. It's the planting of the Lord. You didn't plant yourself. You heard the Holy Spirit. You followed, obeyed Holy Spirit, right? So he planted you. So you are trees of righteousness, or like I said in the New King, in the NIV, it says like oak trees planted by the Lord so that the Lord would be glorified in your life. And every one of us want that. We want the Lord to be glorified in our lives, right? I want the Lord to be glorified. I know you do as well.